ready to begin, uh, I'll take a second to introduce Christopher Cook, as a lot of you know him already. Uh, he is a California Art Club member and uh, has studied with great people like David Gallup, who, David, I saw you popped in here, so that's kind of fun. Um, and we are really lucky uh, tonight to get to get a demonstration, and I will let you take it away. Thank you so much, Wendy. Hi, everyone. Um, as we said, I'm Christopher Cook, and I'm really excited to be here. I've got a demo lined up. I did a plein air painting the other day, and we're going to talk about how I took that plein air painting onto a larger canvas and continued to keep the looseness that you're forced to get while you're on location. Um, of course, some people t get stuck on the details as well on location, but it certainly helps that you have all the moving light and, and either water or wildlife. Um, I find that that the changes actually are beneficial rather than just a challenge to overcome. Um, in overcoming those plein air challenges, uh, you have more options for your design rather than being fixed to a photo. Because things are moving, you get to choose the best of what's in front of you. So, a little bit about me, for those of you who don't know me, I know a few people on the call know my, my background and have known me for quite a while. But for those of you who don't, um, I grew up in Arizona and unlike, I mean, I think every child is, is an artist at heart, right? We all grow up drawing and uh, tuned into our creativity. However, I didn't grow up like so many other artists I know with this intention of becoming an artist. I just didn't even really consider it as a career. It just seemed like too much fun. Um, so even all the way through high school and college, I started to study psychology. And rather than studying art, um, I was in psychology classes and took painting for the first time as an elective at a community college. And that's when I discovered that I had to paint and everything else got thrown to the side. Not, not exactly, but um, really I came from, from a different angle. What I loved about painting wasn't drawing things. It wasn't coming from an illustration background um, or, or even a art or rendering or, you know, it wasn't about describing things. It was about psychology. When I started painting, the thing that fascinated me about it was the ability to see myself in what I created. Um, the mirror that the creative process becomes for the artist was just really the most fascinating aspect of art. And to me, it still is the most fascinating art. Of course, uh, the more I do it, the more fascinated I am, the more I, I fell in love with, with techniques and with learning about painting, with learning uh, about color theory. And I mean, I've always loved color theory, but, but all the aspects of painting that I didn't know to love, I came to love. But but still most of all, it's that personal development journey that painting is. Really, I think you know, everything we do in this life is an opportunity to, to see ourselves. Um, you know, really life's just, it's a, it's a lot of mirrors, you know, people are reflecting back how we're showing up. And for me, the, the particular mirror that I found the most illuminating was painting. Um, every decision you make along the way is, 
is a product of your programming. And I know we're going to be talking about design and looseness. Uh, looseness is one of those things that I think at the root of, of most people's issue is not needing to learn a technique to be looser. It's a matter of values. It's realizing that they value looseness because there's a, a character trait within themselves that they want to be looser and that they need to stop valuing certain things that are keeping them tight. For instance, um, valuing objects and separateness of things. Our belief in the separateness of objects keeps us from being loose and keeps us tied to feeling like we need to define all of the boundaries of, of things. So I'll talk a little bit about that as I demonstrate um, a little more just about me. I, as Wendy said, I am a part of the California Art Club. I joined that pretty soon after I started painting, which was when I was about 19 years old. And I decided to move from Arizona here with just a few dollars in my pocket. Really not hardly, just enough for gas to get here. Um, and I decided to, well, I was plein air painting when I met a bunch of people out there who just happened to be part of the art club. And I just happened to stumble upon them. And they said, you know, join an art club. And it was November or so. So the holiday party was coming up and I saw it and it was like, all of my money to go to it. It was one of those events, just like, it's just like what you normally do for the demos here. You know, it costs what, like $30 or something to go to a dinner and a demo. And in that case, you know, talk. And for me at 19, 20 years old, it was so out of my budget. Um, but I thought whoever these artists are that can afford this chicken dinner, those are the people I need to know you know, I figured they're all making a living at art. Now I know, probably not, but <laughs> that was what my mind thought. And sure enough, it was, it was a great opportunity. I met a group of friends who are friends of mine still today and were students of David Gallup, who took me as a mentor and, um, or well, took me as his apprentice and mentored me for years to this day, so almost a decade now. Um, so I have him to thank for just about everything I know. I've had a few other teachers, but most of what I'll say tonight is something I heard from him. Um, that and just personal experience. So let's get started with, I have a few paintings I wanted to show you and talk about. Matter of fact, something that Wendy said earlier made me think of this one. So let me go ahead and share that particular painting. Let's see. All right, right now we should be seeing some things. Okay, so I think you're seeing this screen. Um, you know, this was just a demo I did for myself of a peony one day, and I really wasn't fully intending for it to, to come out into a painting. Um, I was just sort of practicing painting a peony as I, as I saw it. However, um, what I found is that as I painted it, which I, I start off with the three value study, it turned out into a painting that I really wasn't that thrilled with. Um, it, for me, it wasn't loose enough and it turned out to be a little too realistic. So I ended up scraping the whole thing down and uh, with a palette knife and that's, it revealed some of the canvas underneath it. And- um, Chris, is there a way you can click on that image and make it bigger? Oh, we're is it? All, you know, we're seeing all four images on that. Screen. Oh, are we? Okay, that's good to know because it's different on my screen than.
There we go. Um, should, it should be large now, or is it not? I'm still seeing all four. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Let's go back to, we'll stop sharing and we'll start that share over again. No. If, if you put full screen on your... Here we go. So is it full now? now? We, there you go. Now we okay. have a full of your easel, yeah. Okay. So as I was saying, you know, what, talking about looseness, um, you know, in this one, I, I felt like I was describing a little too many of the edges um, of the of the flowers there. So I ended up just scraping it down. And as I did, I really enjoyed, you know, just what happened to it, uh, the effect. And I think Wendy was talking about William Ray and how, you know, he was just messing with some old paintings and found that he enjoyed it more. Um, and, and that's sort of what happened with this one here. And then I decided just to go with, with sort of a white background that blended into some of the scraping I did. And it really that looseness, there's a lot of ways to achieve looseness and it doesn't just have to be through loose paint. It seems like to me that a lot of what, what causes the looseness is a disregard for the objects. And when bits of that object or bits of a certain value go outside of you know, its own boundaries, outside of the mass of the shape, or when, for instance, the background comes onto the object, and that could be deliberately just placed there. It can be put there by through tangled color. It can be done through scraping with all kinds of utensils, whether it be forks, knives, you know, any any type of tool that you can come up with. It's essentially that there are is the looseness comes from that edge being lost or the par parts of the still life or parts of the object going off of itself. Um, so in this case, some of it came through just uh, through the scraping and then scumbling over with other colors. So beautiful. Thank you. All right. So, you know, as I was saying, um, in my approach to to painting in general, when I when I go out on location, I think most of all, I'm looking to just be present and and use painting as a spiritual um, development opportunity. And for me, that's the most important aspect of art. It's just, you know, what I what am I going to learn today from my painting about myself? Um, you know, I think Kwong Ho told me about this sort of these three different ways that we paint. And the one first most basic level of painting being that we paint from our preconceptions. So painting from our preconceptions would be that we assume that the tree is green, so we paint it green. Or we assume that, um, that the objects are solid, so we paint them solid. And, and that's sort of the most basic rudimentary way that we tend to paint when we're first starting out. And then as time goes by, the, the second way would be to, you know, paint through, you know, kind of clarity of seeing and through what we know to be, to be good, you know, as we've, as we've learned how to see, we're painting that way though intentionally and consciously. So making choices based off of what we've learned through perhaps mastery or, um, or just learning to see clearly. You know, he talks about seeing clearly in the, he compares it to having read some of Helen Keller's writings and, you know, 
just like learning what something is for the first time and and seeing it you know for what it is like you know not not labeled yet not having any preconceived ideas about what it is so um for instance you get a little bit of that when you blur your vision you know it simplifies things and forces you to to see where values connect the objects to the outside our logical mind tends to like to separate things when in reality you know things are much more confusing as they come to us from uh, just in our pure vision it's and if we can recreate that on the canvas that confusion um, then the viewer will actually see things in a more natural way so let's see and then uh, the third way is is to do that but not consciously so the master artist who is in flow has lots of experience behind them has learned those skills but now can do those things intuitively and that's the best space that's the space we all want to get to because when we're doing those same things that we would normally have to choose to do from flow you know it, it comes out more naturally more spontaneous spontaneously and i think that's where real master pieces come from um however you know i don't know that you can always count on that third stage happening you know i think most of all or most of us experience a little of all three of those stages while we paint um, to some degree. We may all have experienced moments of flow in which where our intuition and is guiding us and our intuition is correct, meaning that our intuition is informed. There's some lessons that we've learned in the past that are coming out naturally because we've either practiced them enough or they've become sincere enough, which I really have to emphasize emphasis on that is that really when they become sincere enough they then will flow out naturally and you know the most common way for a lesson to become sincere is through repetition but one thing that i've found uh, really helpful is that when you see it that way that you're waiting for the lesson to become sincere you can move that along quicker by thinking about who you would have to be to have that be a sincere part of, of your values, a sincere part of the way you see the world. Um, so, you know, things that I do to practice that is like when I'm in a museum and I see a painting that I really love, you know, for one thing, if there's a painting you're attracted to, it's not necessarily just because that painting's great, but because that painting represents something that you value. And a lot of times it's a longing for something that represents in my, how I see it is it represents something I want to be. There's a there's a character trait, there's something in the painting that resonates with my ideal version of myself. And that's happening on an intuitive level. However, if I stand in front of that painting in the museum and I ask myself, who would I be if I had painted this? Not how did they paint this, but who would I be if I had painted this? Uh, for me, there's a whole nother level of learning that happens that really accelerates how quickly you can go to apply it. Um, I notice over and over again, you know, when I go to other workshops, you know, people asking the same questions. Sometimes people are, you know, addicted to going to workshops. They go to so many workshops. They go to this workshop, they go to that workshop. And, and I find that a lot of times those students, they know all the lessons. They know what the teacher is going to say. They they already know. Um, 
you know, I, I've been to a few of David's. I, you know, I helped Michael Obermeyer, Peter Adams, uh, Jim McVickers. And I, I remember all of them, there's always, you know, to some extent, some of the basics that they, they already know, but they're still not applying them to their painting. And I find that the reason is because it's not enough to know it intellectually. It has to become sincere. So until we start working on bringing our painting knowledge down into our emotional level, rather than just keeping it intellectual, we're gonna have a hard time applying those things that we learn. So, you know, I, I may repeat this a few times as I go through this, because I really think that that's probably the most important thing in this whole talk that that you can take away is is really a new way of learning you know for me i still have a lot to learn but i know i'm a fairly young artist and, I, and i've done things and i've had a great teacher and and the biggest thing that i've learned is how to think and how to see you know that's that's how you're going to you know grow and learn faster so um you know, for instance, you know, we, we all know now that I was learning from David when we were in class, you know, David would be doing a demo or painting on a painting. And oftentimes, you know, he would walk back because, you know, you step back to look at the canvas. Of course, everybody got in his way right then because, you know, we all want to get up close to the canvas. And I really, I think so many people are asking themselves, you know, how, how did he do that? How did he make that mark? How did he do this thing. And a lot of times I would try to practice when I walked up to the canvas, I would just imagine that I had done it. You know, I wouldn't worry so much how he did it as much as that when I walked up to the canvas, I would imagine I had made the mark and I would try to feel, you know, really feel what did, what would it feel like to have made that mark? What would it feel like to have mixed that color? so much of painting is about feeling. Now there, there are, you know, maybe there are mathematical formulas for what makes a color harmony or mathematical, um, you know, ratios to what makes an elegant shape. Um, but at the end of the day, you can work through that if you know what those colors next to each other are supposed to feel like, what they're, how they're supposed to vibrate with each other, how that, you know, shape aesthetic that you're after feels like, you know, is that shape aesthetic punk rock? Is it classical music? Is it, you know, is it um, what, you know, is it something, you know, calming? What's, what's it feel like? So I think that's probably uh, the most important thing to, to working your way through a, a through a painting is staying in the moment and paying close attention to, to your feelings. Um, and I stress that so much because I think I tend to be a, a rather analytical person. And so I don't know, if, you know, sometimes it takes a lot of work for me to, to get connected to that level. Um, you know, it's all relative, but for me, that's what I spend the most of my time doing. Even on plein air, I spend more of my time connecting to the scene prior to starting painting than I do starting the painting. Um, you know, one time I even went to the beach, got my sleeping bag and spent the night just so that I could paint the sunrise. And it wasn't that I couldn't have drove, driven out there at sunrise but I just knew that you know, I'd have to have all my stuff set up when it got, when the sun was at that perfect moment. And that I wanted to feel, you know, be in the, in the place and just feel what I was feeling being outdoors and being out there at night. Um, and I was pretty happy with the painting that came out from that. But um, let's see, so, yeah, and the other reason, you know, taking that time up front is that the biggest, most important decisions are before you've started the painting. You know, 
nothing's going to affect your painting in execution as much as concept and design and what actually attracted you to painting it. So rushing into it isn't always the best idea. You know, staying out there, looking around and finding what really speaks to you can make, make all the difference. With that said, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen and I'll first talk to you about a few other paintings before I go right into my demo. Actually, that is the demo. Okay, I'll go into this one. Hmm. Well, this is interesting. These photos are. Let's see, I guess I've got my palette. Um, you know, I put this picture. Wendy, are, is are you seeing the screen? Just to make yes, sure. Yes, I see okay. the whole thing. Yeah. Cool. Um. This is what you know my palette typically looks like. Um, I put this in here just as a note that I think you know nothing is going to end up on the canvas that isn't first on your palette. So um, you know if you want really beautiful luscious colors and thick loose paint, you have to use a lot of paint, and you have to make sure your palette looks like the mess you're you're trying to create. I guess I, I put all of these in Ken Bur Ken's burn mode, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna show these, meaning they're they're not the full image. But I have other paintings on this one, so we'll go to this one. Okay. Let's see. Hey Chris, right. can I cut in? David wants to know what is a shape as aesthetic, a punk rock paint aesthetic. Oh, what is a punk rock paint aesthetic? Okay. Um, I like that question. Well, uh, for instance, you know, I think that the the vibe and feelings that come from a shape, you know, first of all, when I think of shape aesthetic, the first thing I think of is, is Art Nouveau. Now, I wouldn't say that's a punk rock shape aesthetic. But as far as describing shape aesthetic, you know, I think everyone here is probably familiar with the Art Nouveau movement. And a shape aesthetic is, is sort of the, the way that the shapes relate to each other, how the, the spaces move and what constitutes harmony in the shapes. Um, in punk rock, you know, there's a lot of dissonance and not harmonious, uh, maybe sounds. So I would say a punk rock shape aesthetic would be one where the shapes are deliberately not harmonious. Um, and so perhaps a harmonious shape, if, if you're going punk rock, would be out of character for, for your painting. Um, it isn't that certain shapes are inherently right or wrong. However, there may be the right or shapes for what you're trying to accomplish. Um, when you're drawing, you know, drawing is not just your ability to render things as they are, but instead they're about your ability to render things as you wish to render them, to make the mark you intend to, to make. Is, is really what good drawing is. You can have good drawing in an abstract painting because you're drawing the shapes with intention. Um, and so just in the same way that, that an abstract painting could be filled with shapes with a certain feeling and a certain ratio to them um, perhaps the way the shape is broken at its, you know, in its masses and the w kind of repeats itself in the, in the way that the 
shapes are broken up as, the, as you get down into the details and follow that same sensibility. So, yeah. Um, for instance, I think in, in this painting that we're looking at now, I think I was excited a little bit about punk rock. You would, you know, you wouldn't think of a hummingbird as, as punk rock right away, but you know, this is a little punk rock hummingbird in my opinion. You know, these, these grungy ways that the, the red here, you know, kind of splatters across the sky or the way the, the sky hole is broken in the cloud. If we were imagining how, you know, Art Nouveau, you know, maybe Alphonse Mucha or somebody like that would have done a similar scene, you'd have all these flowing lines. And to me, that would be a much more, um, that would be more harmonic in, in its own way. It would be kind of more, um, more beautiful, I guess you would say. Because I don't think of punk as being particularly beautiful. However, you can enjoy it and, and like it more. Um, and for me, I like it more. So for me, rather than doing a painting of a hummingbird that's also uses beautiful shapes that are really elegant, to me, that's not as exciting as doing a painting of a hummingbird where there's a feeling of static noise. Um, which to me emulates more, even though hummingbirds are very delicate, that static noise kind of reminds me of the humming of a hummingbird and what it feels like to maybe be a hummingbird. They're, you know, maybe they're a little anxious or maybe they're, um, they're flighty, they're, they're, they're moving quickly. To me, that, that is punk rock, but that's my own vision of a hummingbird. That might not be the same vision somebody else has of one. Um, so, I don't know. I think hopefully that answered your question, David. <laughs> um, as I go into this painting, not only was I going to talk about looseness, which I had promised, um, the same kind of things happening here. I've broken up the edges and disregarded the form of the objects by allowing bits of the hummingbird color, you know, to be outside of the hummingbird. So I think everyone can see my mouse spinning around. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, there are marks here and here below the hummingbird that, that have some of the shadows or colors from the bottom of the hummingbird that are really not in the hummingbird or represent anything that's in the scene. Um, for instance, the same thing is happening with, with other colors that are just out here. This red really has nothing to do with anything other than that it relates to the red that's on the hummingbird. Um, and those sort of things are a way that you can gain looseness in your painting. Um, you know, by being playful, you know, in this case, I made those marks by using a squeegee and running them it over the painting that I had done in plain air. I started in plain air, then I took a squeegee with different colors and then came back in and worked over it until I got both the squeegee marks I wanted as well as the descriptive marks that I wanted. Because obviously when I squeegeed over it, I got, it got rid of a lot of the painting and it got rid of parts that I wanted. So I had to go back and repaint those parts. Um, if you can see here, there's a little bit of this wing that's repeating itself. And there are these dots that don't necessarily mean anything except that I felt like they emulated sort of the shape that I saw in the hummingbird's face. So th those were a little bit about the looseness. And now what I'm talking about are things that have to do with design. Um, in this piece, I used these shapes to line up with the hummingbird and create a horizontal energy that moved across what would have been mostly vertical energies. You know, the tree creates a vertical energy. The 
of the marks of this squeegee through the clouds, I have some, some streaks that move down are also creating vertical energy. The mass of this cloud is more of an elongated shape vertically than it is horizontally. So the, in order to have balance and to not have all vertical energies, I created horizontal energies through aligning elements like these marks, which create a, a visual line that you can follow by connecting the dots. Um, a lot of what I think about when I'm thinking about design is, is just balance of, of weight and movement of energy. Uh, for instance, there's a lot of weight on the right-hand side because this cloud is a large mass, the tree is a large mass, and these bigger masses are, are balanced out by these small shapes, which are closer to the edge. The tree is here closer to the middle, but on the right-hand side. And so it's a large weighted shape and it can be closer to the middle and, and still be balanced by a small shape as long as that sh smaller shape like these red marks and those little purple marks are close to the edge. That tension that they have against the edge really um, increases the amount of weight that they carry. So that's all I wanted to say, think about that painting. All right, here we have another piece. Some people that I've shown this painting don't see the object that it is. So most people I think do, but a number of people I've shown this painting, they don't even know what the painting's of. So I'll, I'll let you in on, on the subject first, which is that I painted a jack-o'-lantern here. Um, however, you know, in this painting, what I was really excited about, what I was going for was, you know, how can I paint this pumpkin and try to lose the pumpkin almost entirely? I'm really excited by merging the abstract with realism. And, you know, there's certainly plenty of painters who do realism really well and they're painting abstract paintings, they've just made all of the abstract elements into visual things, which is also, you know, what I recommend in designing something real is to, is to, you know, start with abstract, think abstract when you're designing, and then justify those abstract shapes with objects, with, um, you know, if, if you ha need a shadow or a certain value here, maybe that can be the, the shadow of something. But in this case, I really didn't justify things with objects. I sort of just entirely disregarded the objects um, by running values through the pumpkin entirely. I created this um, cruciform design, which is where you have a horizontal and a vertical energy that sort of converge near your focal point. Uh, it doesn't have to be exactly where your focal point is. In this case, it's pretty darn close. However, the line of, of these darks kind of land here just off to the left. And then of course, you're automatically brought into the area of most detail, which is this candle. Um, the concept behind this piece, if I can go into concept for a minute, I think I, is, is that I wanted to, again, you know, I'm always thinking sort of on a spiritual level with my painting. And for me, this represented sort of the spirit of the jack-o'-lantern. Um, and a lot of times I don't decide what my paintings about until I'm part of the way through. I allow myself to work intuitively at the beginning. And then when I'm, you know, most of the way through with the design or, or part of the way through, I start to think about 
what is this painting really about to me? And then how can I enhance what it's about? So because my initial thought was to lose the objectivity, lose the, well, not the, the object, the superficial uh, aspects of this pumpkin and, you know, make it into something that is abstract, it started to read to me as, as being about this, um, you know, spirit of the pumpkin, something besides seeing the outside of the pumpkin first. So that was when I decided to make the candle um, visible, even though you would normally not see it, because I thought, well, the candle is sort of the the aspect of a jack o' lantern that turns a pumpkin into a jack jack o' lantern. Besides the facial features, but it's that life force for the for the pumpkin. So. Oh, another thing, you know, in this painting, as well as another one that I'm going to show you, the object is is very centered. However, this one is more so even than than some other ones, you know, it's a sphere in the middle of a painting, which is, you know, known to be kind of a rule not to do in your paintings. However, you know, you can get away with that as long as your value shapes are not the shape of your objects, which they really shouldn't be anyway. And by having an asymmetrical shape of values, in this case, you know, the centered object is, is entirely turned into this asymmetrical design because most of the object is entirely lost into the background, which is something I, I just really enjoy doing. I have a tendency to paint things centered in the canvas almost just because I love getting away with that. Let's see, did I go too far? Okay, that was the next painting. Okay, here's a painting I finished recently. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about the design elements in this piece. So in the previous piece, <clears throat> I talked about that cruciform design, which was that the energies created a meeting point where the focal is. This is that's happening a little bit in this as well. However, in this one, I was more going uh, for this di a dynamic tension, which is a term you know David would use for when there's sort of these two masses of, of the same kind of element. For in this case, you know, I have a dark, my darkest darks are where the bird is, which is what I'm trying to bring you to focus. And also down at the bottom, this larger mass. And the two of those create a dynamic tension between them in which your eye moves back and forth between those two masses. So that creates its own energy. You know, anywhere there are elements of the same type, you have a tendency to move around between them. And so the, the spacing of those elements is really critical to the balance of your design. So for instance, when I'm going through a painting, not only am I thinking about the arrangement of my values, but I'm also thinking about the arrangement of the colors and marks that I make. In this painting, uh, there's this pink that's being brought throughout the painting that is also just, just an element that has really nothing to do with anything um, that's in the desert. It's just an element that I thought was a complementary color. I enjoyed this pink and, and yellow and blue, <clears throat> which is sort of about, you know, these primary colors, you know, red, yellow, blue. And 
the pink, you know, it just sort of goes around the canvas in a way that was very deliberate. I could f feel out that s spacing. And I don't know, I think I first sort of did this, you know, as a kid, just doodling, where you're just making little dots and stuff. And you'd kind of have a sense for where the next dot should go on your paper, or the next shape. But the way to sort of determine that is, is that the dots become these groups. So for instance, if I look up here, I have this grouping of a lot of small bits of pink. And the next shape that I come to is this shape of the pink, which is sort of spaced out in just the right distance to both feel separate from the rest and also still a part of that group. So at that distance in which the shape could, could be separate from the group, but also could be considered to be part of the group, that's usually that sweet spot as to where to place the shape. The same thing happens if you consider those to be a group, then you get this larger pink spot and it becomes the next spot that could be a part of that group or could be feeling you know, just a little further. And if you continue to go with that same type of thought in mind, naturally you'll find this mathematical spacing where the, the shapes or the, the color mark that you're making, you know, just feel like they have a harmonious spacing. So, you know, in this painting, I did that with the pinks. I also went around and did it in a different way with the yellow and in a different way with the, the almost white <clears throat> cream color. Um, and, you know, felt my way through to achieve balance. Um, part of that balance and asymmetry is in variety, having a variety of spaces. It was very important to me that the all these vertical lines, that none of them be exactly the same space from another one as they are from, from the next one. You know, that space between them is different between the edge here uh, is different than this cactus from the edge, uh, which is different from that. So in the same way that you're sort of feeling out the spacing between these pink marks that are more scattered, I'm also feeling out the spacing between these vertical areas of the cactus. Um, so a lot of that can be done intuitively, but also you know, checking to make sure that you don't have repetition. Okay. Uh, here's a, a piece. Let's see if I can get. Let's see if I can land on it. Okay, there we go. Uh, this piece was in the gold medal show a few years back. Silent, if you're familiar with that show with the California Art Club, um, it's a it's a larger piece. About I think it was about five feet tall. Five feet, yeah. Um, yeah, I learned a lot in doing this piece. I I, I think it was at the time the biggest piece I had taken from a plein air study to a canvas. Um, and really, you know, there was so much in learning about design and how to, you know, this was really one of those first pieces where I really was uh, excited to get away with 
putting an object in the center of the canvas and making a design that worked and caused you to, to move through the object. So um, I think this next photo will show you the plain air study I did, you know, entirely different. A matter of fact, this plain air study is really much more what the scene looked like than what my final painting was. <laughs> um, it was a really gray overcast day and the sky, you know, blended right into the water. It was just all this gray. And there really wasn't an interesting design about it. In this case, the mass of the dark was, you know, it happened to be really dark down here at the base of the rocks. And that was all pretty evenly dark. There was a rock out in the center of it that was also this big dark space. The bird poop that was all over the rock, you know, was pretty evenly distributed. Um, so there wasn't a whole lot interesting, even though, you know, it did attract me to the scene and I wanted to get away with it. So after I did the plein air study, which was mostly focused on just, you know, capturing what I saw, I did this little charcoal sketch, which really had the same spirit as the plein air study I did. Again, just kind of capturing what I saw, same sort of thing. So after I did this, charcoal sketch, um, I did another one. And this charcoal sketch was totally different. It was, don't draw what I see, choose what I see. So in this one, I made lots of notes and was thinking about where can I lose the edges of this rock? Where can I break? And I've maybe I've put little arrows and I made notes to myself, I said, here, uh, the value of this bird poop in shadow is the same value as the sky. There is an opportunity to lose that edge because they're the same value up against the same value. That's a perfect spot to, to make it loose. And, and I went around the whole rock making notes of spaces that I felt like oh, I can lose an edge here. I could lose an edge there. And then you know deliberately said i know all these rocks at the base of the rock are dark but i'm just going to make a shape where the darkest of the darks and and that's sort of a way that you can think about it when you're on location you get to break up those three values however you want and you can even break them up so that it's true to life but you've just chosen where where is dark going to stop and where is middle value going to start and by compressing and, and forcing yourself into three values, you create a lot of opportunity for more looseness in your painting, because if you only have three values, you're gonna have more opportunities where the same value meets up against the same value, which is a great spot to completely just blur that edge of where the object begins in the background or the other object or the the water is. So uh, in this case, I was just much more deliberate in creating paths through the rock. And um, you know, here I, I did a big mass of dark down at the base of the canvas to anchor it. And then I was thinking, how is that big mass going to turn into smaller masses or lines or calligraphy, which is a term again that, that David uses, calligraphy is that where those value shapes meet, you get the, the shapes that, that create the form of the objects and they become this descriptive, beautiful line work where that mass of say shadow or mass of dark meets the the middle values or meets the light and becomes broken and breaks up into the next shape so we'll get more into that as we go here um so let's see
Let's see if we have this. Okay. I should just play. So here I am working that that study that I did up into the big campus. I guess it maybe it wasn't five feet. I, I don't know what size that is. Um, I can't really tell. So here's a picture of the, the plein air study. Then I did another value study in just a brown, I usually use raw umber. And then I went to the big canvas. And this was about midway through the painting, which there was still a whole lot of stuff to figure out. And then this was what it eventually became. So as I was saying, you know, the first part of design is, is looking at the big picture. Um, you know, how do these shapes use the whole canvas? And then I usually work myself into smaller and smaller detail. You know, is that, sh as we were talking about before, shape aesthetic, is that shape aesthetic repeating itself on the smaller scale? Is the way the big masses and big shapes that use the canvas, is are they being broken up in the same way that the small shapes are being broken up? Um, and so here you're taking a look at a detail of how you know this shadow is being broken up and these clouds and, and this little sky hole, you know, they all have a certain feeling about them. And then this was, you know, the water. So um, same sort of thing, working on those shapes. And I really love working in the studio. I, I used to do a lot more plein air. I still do plein air, but my idea of what I'm doing in plein air has entirely changed because I really enjoy taking the painting further in the studio and all that you can do with time, you know, finessing the shapes and, and making them more elegant, making them as, as beautiful as I can, as opposed to just the, um, the quick work of, of plein air. However, plein air is great for, um, for inspiration. So here I am, we're gonna get into our demo I went ahead and recorded this ahead of time just so that I could talk over it here and we could get a lot further with the demo in the amount of time we have. So the plain air piece here, I'm starting with my three value study. Um, I've toned the canvas off with a neutral color, raw umber. It's not terribly a warm, it's not a terribly warm brown. Um, it's sort of on the cooler side, so it's fairly neutral. And I tone it to a very middle value. So, you know, sort of the value that I want my middle values to be. That way, my lights are going to show up on top of that. My shadows are also going to show up on top of that. And then I just worry about the shapes of those light and shadows. Usually as I'm starting on location, I tend to start with the light, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, the tendency after I get my middle on there is to start with my shape of light just because in plain air, the light is what's changing all the time and you wanna get that shape down as soon as you can. Um, however, I will start with whatever is the most fleeting thing. So in some cases, um, it's a different effect. It's it's the wave that's at you know a certain moment, or it's the um, there's you know maybe it's the shadows. I have had times where the shadows move very quickly, 
especially in the forest, if I'm painting out in the forest, the shadows are moving around so fast. Um, and if, th if that's what your painting is about, then you know that's what I would usually recommend starting with. Um, you know, speaking of those shapes and what it's about, the other thing is that whatever value you have the least of in your painting is going to end up being your most important value or your most important shape of values. Because the thing you have least of um, it tends to draw people's attention. You know, when we look at the sky and we see the stars, there's a lot more space than there are stars. The stars are the thing there's less of, um, but we see the stars. Or if I have a blank page and I put a red dot on it, you're gonna say, what's, what is there? There's a red dot, right? You're not gonna say, oh, there's a bunch of white space. Um, it's that thing that's scarce that we value so much. So uh, when you're working with, with your piece, that's something to think about, you know, how much middle value do you want? How much dark value are you, are you putting in? And, um, you know, which one is it really about? Another way you can emphasize the one that it's about is your, your value steps. And what I mean by that is what is the distance in value from your dark to your middle? Are your is your dark value and your middle value closer? If they're closer, that's gonna cause your light value to be even that much more important. If your middle value and your light value are compressed and closer together, then your dark value is gonna stand out more. Um, I think in this case, oh, okay, let's see. So I know that was really, really fast. So let me stop. But that's because most of the painting is gonna be me taking this painting and bringing it to a bigger canvas. So let's, let's see. Okay, so this was sort of where I ended up with, with the plein air study. And it was a really fast plein air study anyway. Um, but we, you know, doubled the speed here. Like I said, with the other ones, I sort of had, I looked out there and what I saw was I was standing over this little creek ravine that runs behind like our neighborhood. And there were these little birds, which I learned are called coots. <laughs> Prior to looking them up, they were always the bird that that's not a duck. The one that you look at and you said, that's not a duck. <laughs> um, but it has duck feet and whatnot, but it has a little pointy bill. So I decided I liked, there was these brush that were, were coming down over the creek and this little coot was kind of sneaking out from underneath the brush along the creek bed. And then there was another one that was swimming alongside it in the creek. And after a while of, of you know, just staring and, and thinking about what I was attracted to, I really got interested in the narrative story of, of these little, you know, birds walking along the creek. Um, you know, so, I decided that this one was going to be the focal point because you know it was just interesting coming out from under there. And in order to do that, I thought about where my energy flows would be. So we've got these sticks, these these twigs of the brush that are curled, that are coming down. And I, I like the shape they were making. However, you know, of course I chose where they're going to be. So I, I was inspired by the scene, but I was kind of choosing the spacing and, and where I felt that they should be relative to each other. And the energy was this downward energy that, that led you to the bird. However, 
that bird, you know, was more hidden than the, the one that was kind of surrounded by, you know, this one value. But I felt like between the energy, you know, coming down from, from these twigs and then this other bird sort of lining up off of the edge of the canvas, you sort of get this energy that comes through my focal area. I've also got my darts in this creek bed, which also create a horizontal energy sort of right here underneath the bird. Um, some elements of design that I was thinking about in this was, you know, my mass, my masses, you know, having large masses of both of light and of darks. So these darks were, there were some leaves and, you know, some shadows of these brush. And I didn't want any of the masses to really repeat each other. So I wouldn't want this mass of dark to be the same size as this mass of light. So having that asymmetrical balance was really important to me. Um, and then my concept was to come into an area of complicated pattern that was mostly middle and light versus over here, a more graphic shape of dark. So again, we're looking for variety. Let's see. We'll go on to the, between this plein air study and the larger painting, I, I put this small bit of, let's see. Where's my? I don't know where my play button went. There's my play button. Okay. Okay, just because I thought it was fun, this was a, a short bit of video of me doing a bunch of three value studies with a giant paint roller on a bunch of canvases that I gessoed. They're actually wood panels. And I just spent the night doing three value studies on these very large panels with a roller. So as you see, I'm, I'm doing my dark values. And um, I, I did the middle value first. And I just let the white of the, of the canvas be the light values. And that was the beginning of a bunch of paintings I'd done. They were all paintings that I had done three value studies for in the past. And then I just decided I wanted to take them all into onto big canvases. But so that night I was really thinking about design. Okay, let's see. So we're gonna get on to the bigger canvas. So this is an 18 by 18 square panel and I've already toned it off and I'm going about doing the same bits, um, you know, getting my shape of light in here However, as I'm doing this, I'm also thinking about the changes I want to make to it. For me, the best plein air painting to take onto a bigger canvas is one that I didn't get, that where I didn't finish, where I didn't get my idea out, where I didn't feel like the painting was a success. And that's why nowadays when I do plein air, I'm not even looking to do a complete painting. Because when I do a complete painting, I don't have the motivation to want to do it on a bigger painting. I don't want to recreate the painting. I like to have that feeling of engaged creation. And so if the painting that I originally did is, is too much what I was trying to say, 
then I really, you know, just am gonna leave the painting as it is and not mess with it. However, um, you know, when I have a, a design that I like, but I feel like it could be taken further with brush work or um, just the whole concept can be taken further, you know, then, then I get excited. So here I am. One of the things I did is I made the brush bigger. Um, by making the brush bigger, I made the birds smaller on the scale of the canvas. That increased because as I thought about what the story was, it's this bird coming out from under the brush. And by making the bird smaller, you, you sort of get more of this um, kind of like it's hidden in the brush. It's, it's being covered up by this. It's coming out of something and, and the world is bigger. Um, and I like that sense of, of it being a part of this, you know, bigger world, that, that it's this little bird. Um, that was just an important part of the narrative. And really you want your abstract painting, meaning your design, to support your narrative. So if it's important to the narrative, the bird's small, then an abstract element would be, you know, how big are the other shapes? How big, um, what is the relative size? That doesn't change anything about the bird or the narrative. That just changes the, the abstract element of that relative size of the shapes. Um, so also I wanted the pattern to be more interesting on the, on the left-hand side on our left. So I, I got a little more into the pattern. I thought on the bigger canvas, I could have that pattern happen more. Um, and I also made the, the other shape of the darks a more vertical energy, shoved it further to the right-hand side to, to even increase that difference between what the mass of the lights and middles versus the mass of the shadows was. Um, let's see. So another thing I'm thinking about here is, is that you know when I'm breaking my canvas up into quadrants, I don't want any of my quadrants to be symmetrical. So again, you know, like we said, we don't want the same size of shapes repeating, the same distance of shapes repeating. And I don't really want the same ratio of values in each quadrant. So a lot of times I'll say if if one quadrant is mostly light with a little bit of middle, I don't want another one of my quadrants of the painting to also be mostly light with middle. I'll, I'll, or at least I don't want one to mirror the other. So in this case, right, if we take the lower left-hand quadrant, it's mostly middle with a tiny bit of light. You know, you have the light on the water, these little bits of light. The upper left-hand quadrant is a kind of equal middle and light, but a lot more light so it's, it's a mostly light quadrant, um, light values with, with middle. And then I have my top right-hand quadrant of this painting. It's mostly dark values with some middle values in it. And then my lower left-hand corner, or my lower right-hand corner is, you know, mostly middle value with some dark shapes. So that's sort of one, one more thing I'm thinking about. Um, variety is really the secret, not secret, but it's, it's an important part of the equation when it comes to design. Um, if, if you're looking at something like a dice or a road sign, you know, right, those are meant to give you information very quickly. So everything is symmetrical. You're traveling down the highway at 60 miles an hour, 65 miles an hour. You have to know what the sign says in an instant. They very intentionally make them symmetrical, simple, symbolic shapes. Um, you know, whether it's there's a curve in the road up ahead, right, it's the most simple shape that they can make. 
um, or a person walking in a crosswalk. It's, it's gonna be centered in your sign and it's gonna be the most simple shape. And what we're trying to do as artists is the entirely opposite thing. We don't wanna communicate our idea as quickly as possible. We wanna communicate as long as possible. We wanna create a painting that lives with the person for a long time. Something that somebody can continue to look at for years and years, for decades. So we want our shapes to be complex. We want to not have things be symmetrical. We want our color complex, our brushwork complex. We want every aspect of the painting to, to be something that's considered and intentional and, and typically complex, though you know maybe not everything is complex, maybe you choose. Maybe you decide to offset something, a, a com complex brushwork with, with a simplistic one. I'm, that's making me think of um, an artist named Dan McCaw, if anyone's familiar with him. He does this really beautiful brushwork. Um, the brushwork is, is super thick and luscious and, and gorgeous. And a lot of times he'll do big spaces of really simple grays, you know, flat color. And, you know, he pulls it off. It looks really beautiful. You, the flat color really emphasizes how complex the, um, the brushwork that he did use was. So most of all, it's about being intentional. So throughout the painting, you know, after I had my big masses, I started thinking about how am I breaking up those masses um, into smaller shapes. And again, you know, part of the way to keep things loose is to keep things loose from the beginning. By not starting with a drawing, by not starting with edges, you have, you're inventing the painting as you go. The, um, you know, it's sort of at the end of the painting that you want to start to bring things into focus or choose where a hard edge should be, where you want someone's eyes to, to rest or be drawn to. Uh, naturally, someone's gonna look where there's a hard edge. And rather than the default being drawing and then loosening it up, if you start by the default being that everything is going to be loose, everything is going to have soft edges, and then I'm only going to use an edge or bring something into higher focus when I intentionally want that to be an area of higher focus, an area of, of tighter painting, which is fine to have, it's going to be, you know, because it's necessary to what you're trying to communicate. And so by doing that last, um, it, it sort of makes it more intentional and makes it um, rare, you know, it makes it, it makes it instead of a painting of, of description, it makes it a, an impression with some areas of higher focus. Hey, Chris, just to interrupt real quick, uh, somebody would like to know uh, what colors you started with on your palette. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, let's see. I start with, like, as far as out of the tube, probably, what we're thinking. Right. Okay. Well, every color that I've put on the canvas is a, is a color I've mixed. Um, however, I do start with a sort of a, a warm and cool of each, of each color, kind of, like, I, a cad red and an alizarin crimson, um, a warm 
like cadmium yellow deep and a lemon yellow, which tends to be a little brighter and cooler. Um, I use a yellow ochre, um, which is, you know, of course, more warm and neutral. It's a great color for, um, you know, it's sort of a cheat color because it's, it's already close to where you're trying to go with a lot of earth tones and middle values. So it's a perfect color to, to mix into these, you know, bringing that yellow ochre more to the orange side, bringing it more to the green side and tangling those together. Uh, but if I just go through my palette as I have it set up, I have cad red, cad orange, transparent orange, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, deep, lemon yellow, a, th a phthalo green, and a phthalo blue, an ultramarine blue, dioxazine purple, quinacridone, magenta, and alizarin crimson. And of course, I also have, you know, white. I just using permalba here, which is a titanium uh, blend with, I think, zinc white and titanium together. Oh. Um, however, you know, I, I just like to mix all of my colors as I go, I really enjoy the fact that, you know, it, it comes out a little bit different each time. I'm not trying to recreate the color exactly. Okay, so this was the end result of, of that painting session there. So that's, I think, where I stopped with it. Um, so this painting could still go a little further, but you know some of the differences you know you can see from the plein air study to this was I. The, I see that was that was the plein air study, and then yeah, here's where it where it ended up. So beautiful, I love your colors. So yeah much more, you know, the plein air study was much duller. And then as I went to the studio, I really like to be playful with color. I, I'm not so interested in, in the color of, of grass and of, <laughs> of twigs. I kind of just like to use color for color's sake. So, um, but one of the ways to, you can get away with that is that as long as your color is mixed to the correct value, uh, you can get a lot more place, playful with colors because they'll read as far as the form you're trying to create if you have your values in the correct place. Um, another place you can get away with more color is in the shadows because we tend to see the color of objects as the lit side of an object. So whatever colors are in the shadows, we don't read those as the color of the objects. Um, which actually is, is sort of the same when it comes to looseness, you know, just the same way that, that the lit side is where our eyes look and judge the accuracy of the color and the shadow side is where we can get away with just about anything. The same is true with where you put your hard edges. Where you decide to describe an object, it's very important that that is accurate. But by losing the rest of the object, you actually get better drawing because it allows the viewer to imagine the rest of the object. So by having just the, the places that come into focus be accurate, um, you can convey a lot more with a lot less work than, you know, trying to render every aspect of the painting. So I think that it, since that was the finish of that demo, um, I'm sure there are some questions.
Great. So if everybody would like to turn, uh, if you could, um, we might have to, I don't know, I don't see you, Chris. Oh, yeah, uh, I can come back. Uh, if anybody would like to ask some questions, they can just um, unmute themselves and maybe even turn on their camera so he can see who he's talking to. Um, and I'm sure we do have questions. Yeah, I know I ran through that really quick. I was tr trying to get a lot, a lot in, in our hour and a half. Well, and definitely now I want to go loosen up a lot of my paintings. I'm definitely inspired with uh, the fun and the color and the texture. And so I can't wait. Good. I'm glad. Um, do we have... Uh... So Chris, was that a fan brush you used? I was using a fan brush. Yes. Um, personally, I like, you know, when I have a tendency that when I'm, you know, really trying to be loose, like looser than normal, I have a tendency to use the fan brush and use certain tools, not because they're the only way to be loose, but actually because I tend to have less control with the fan brush. Mm. Um, the fan brush is, is an odd shape to me. And just by the fact that that I have, I tend to make interesting marks. I can turn it in ways that that sort of make interesting marks, and um, you know that allows me to get, be a little looser. Yeah, anyway. I was watching you use your you know technique with how you held your brush and using that fan brush. It was great. Yeah, and I'll grab some other brushes that I like to use are you know, for different effects are these giant Home Depot cheap, you know, $1 brushes. Um, right. They're really great for, you know, just loosening something up, softening an edge. You could run it right through and drag a paint and, and make a whole area soft or Chris, load it up with a lot of color. Is that what you were doing with the squeegee sort of loosening i mean uh smudging it or yeah absolutely in the same way that the squeegee is going to pull paint and and loose it blend the colors um and it also just creates a variety of marks you know those those different types of marks i find are you know we're getting into brushwork but it also is looseness you know brushwork is that feeling of looseness. And so using a variety of tools in a variety of ways is going to just add to the level of, um, you know, playfulness and, and different ways of softening an edge. You know, you're going to get a different type of soft edge if you drag a brush, that big brush through it, that kind of creates a grainy streaky look versus the squeegee, which is going to create, you know, um, sort of these, well, it does a number of things, you know, if there's a thicker spot, it'll drag that th thick bit of paint further than it does the thin paint. So it, it creates, you know, a different type of, of edge. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Very cool. Do we have Very any other? Cool. Any other questions? Like Let's see. Um, I know a lot of Maybe people, not. they try to figure out how to work the uh, audio. Yeah, that's true. It's in the, <laughs> low, well, at least on mine, it's in the lower left-hand corner is where my mute button is. And then you just want it to be unmuted. I have a, I I have I, a question. Do you use yeah. medium? Stay. Well, Paul? Do you use a medium? Oh, do I use a medium? In this painting, there was no medium used. So it was all just paint straight from, straight in the thickness of the, of the paint. Though in different painting, paintings, I, I do sometimes if I'm trying to do like thinner painting where I'm using more squeegee, um, I use Galkid, which or sometimes liquid or galkid. The galkid 
is kind of stickier and um, just has does an interesting thing with with the squeegee. You get a different type of of mark. But for all of that thick, juicy paint, I really you know want it to be thick, so I don't thin it at all. Great. Yeah. All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions, um, I personally would like to thank you a billion trillion times. Uh, I so enjoyed this. I am so inspired and uh, I'm sure everybody else is also. And then we will uh, keep in touch with you about maybe a future workshop as soon as we, especially when we can get together. Uh, I'm putting myself on the list. Awesome. I, I really enjoyed this too. Thank you for everyone who showed up. And just as I'm thinking about it, to thank everybody, I wanted to offer a 40 minute one-on-one -on -one actually um, art consultation with anybody who's on the call. I you know do have to limit it, I think, to like the first 10 people, but for the first 10 people who decide to email me or text me, I am happy to set up a meeting with you, a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call where we can critique, ask any questions you want about your art, just you know, email me a quality image of a painting you want critiqued, or just if you wanna just talk about something specific to your work, like, how you can whatever you know get looser or you have a certain goal with your work um if it's color related or brushwork related or um even if it's more of you know want to talk more about that personal development or if you think there's something you're stuck on and you think well how could what would that look like to for me to go through the process of thinking about you know making that into a sincere change, you know, be like, oh, I know the technique I want to do, but I want to talk about like how to, you know, be that person that, that, you know, thinks more this way or, or embraces that. Um, or if we want to just look at artists and talk about uh, inspiration and stuff like that. So I'm open to that for the first 10 people who who email me for that opportunity and anyone who wants to sign up if you're already on my newsletter that's great if you're not on my newsletter i intend to video the finishing touches to this painting and send out the rest of what i do to continue to work the shapes and you know refine them and get that painting to where I would call it done. So. Very and cool. And then I send it to Very anybody cool. who's on that email list. Great. Well, I've already sent you an email that I want to work yes. with you. So. <laughs> Absolutely, so you're already on the list. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, well, Chris, thank you. I really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to following you and hopefully continuing with more lessons in the future. And uh, definitely everybody get on his mailing list. I think this is all super important information. So cool. thank you all. Thank now go you. have your dinner. Yeah. We're probably starving. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Everyone. I really had fun. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Diane. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Nancy. Hey, Nancy, <laughs> David, good to see you. Good to see you, honey. Good, great job, Chris. We really enjoyed Very it. Very good. Bravo. Bravo. So, so generous of you to Bravo, give 30 minutes to people. Yeah. Yeah. Great job. Uh, anybody who doesn't do that, I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy people. Is, David, what, you're next. Where is the yep. uh, uh, me. email address? Christopher. Yes. So Please? my, first of all, my website, yes, for everyone to, who needs to know, my website is www, obviously, uh, clcookcreative.com. That's clcookcreative.com. My phone number, if you want to text me, is on the website. My email is also on the website. 
and where you can sign up to my newsletter is also on the website, all very easy to find on the website. But just so you know, the email is the same as the website, CL Cook Creative. It's just Gmail. So oh, okay. CL so Cook Creative. CL dot com cook at gmail or yeah cl cook creative at gmail so oh, consistent great, great great yeah and again thank you so much i'm gonna go but i really enjoyed sharing with all of you and thank and you. look forward even more to connecting in person and when we can you know when that time comes and at least our one-on-one -on -one zooms for whoever takes advantage of that that'll be fine Great. Thanks Thank again, Christopher. Thank Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for coming. <laughs>